Well, good morning to each and every one of you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I want to welcome you here. I want to welcome you if you are on any of our sites, wherever you are. And uh, I know I say it all the time. I'm going to keep saying it. Uh, we think about you every week, every service. And so you matter. And if you're watching this online, wherever you are uh, in the city, in the state, in the country or in the world, wherever you're watching this from, uh, we have you on our minds as well. And we're very grateful that you're a part of this. Before I get to the message, a couple of things I want to do. Uh, I want to remind you of what I reminded you of last week. This next week is going to be an incredible week in the history of our church. Uh, this next, uh, starting on Thursday night with our Thursday night service and then into the weekend, uh, we're going to uh, celebrate the kind of the heritage and the legacy of our church. Um, the guy that, I, that, I, that was the lead pastor before me 25 years ago, he handed uh, the reins of this to me and asked me, you know, to uh, be the lead pastor and the board did. And so I've done that for the last 25 years. Well, He's going to be back next weekend. Dr. Leroy Lawson, he's going to bring the message. And I'm telling you, we're going to have a ball. He is a wonderful guy. Some of you guys have never met him or seen him. You need to meet him and you need to see him. So he's going to bring the message. And then next weekend, we're going to have on our staff, beginning his one year, uh, kind of getting ready to be the next lead pastor. Sean Moyers is going to be here. So you're going to get a chance he spoke here not long ago, but you're going to get to meet him now as my successor. Again, not this year, one year from now. And all of this is going to happen next weekend, and you absolutely don't want to miss it. The second thing that's going to happen next week is on Saturday, uh, we are doing Mobilize. And again, Mobilize is our way to serve the community. We serve single moms. We serve the homeless. We serve schools. We serve uh, ministries. Uh, and folks, I, want, I really do want to ask you to put off your yard work on Saturday morning and uh, come and let's serve and let's make a, a, a big difference. And then I want to introduce somebody to you um, who I, this is so exciting for me. To, we have a group of guests with us today that uh, we are absolutely thrilled to have with us. And you might remember, and I believe it was probably November, that Bob Roberts, um, my Baptist preacher friend from Dallas, if that rings a bell, he came and he brought the message and uh, just did a fantastic job. But he's actually back, he's with us this morning. He's not gonna preach today, but he brought with him a whole bunch of his friends from literally around the world. And Kaylin, can you, uh, Kaylin, wherever you are, Bob, would you uh, introduce, uh, again, just give us an idea, what are y'all doing here? So these are pastors and imams from Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, and we get them together so they get along. And they're not afraid of one another. And so we have done work in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. They're now being trained to go back to their country and they'll do those same retreats. Some of these imams, this is their first Sunday in church. And they have, yeah, this is the first time they've ever been to church. And I have not yet talked any of them into being baptized. I tried, have not given up, but, uh, if they would, if, first of all, I would like to recognize he works with the government of Kazakhstan and he is with the religion committee and he is with the government in making this happen. And he works with the, gov with the, the president of Uzbekistan and works with the religion right. committee and is also making that happen. And this man is an ambassador and is a very fun man. I love being around. So I'm going to ask all that feel comfortable, would you mind standing? We would like to honor you. Would you stand at this time? Thank you. All right. Thank you. We love you, Kyle. God bless you. Thank you for and letting we us We love come. you, Bob. Hey, seriously, I said this to you outside. It is an honor and just the privilege to have you all here today. Thanks for being a part of this. All right. Okay, so let's get to it. Let's uh, pull out our Bibles. We're gonna be in Luke chapter 18. If you'll find Luke 18 in your Bible, um, we are gonna to continue today in a series that we started last week, it's called Crossroads. And the whole idea behind Crossroads is about the choices that we make. And we all have choices to make. Now, I wanna say this, every, uh, every decision you make, you can go this way or you can go that way. You can choose that direction or you can choose that direction. That's the essence of a choice. Uh, but if you go that way, uh, this won't be your destination. 
And if you go this way, that won't get you there, okay? So what, with the choices we make, take us places, all right? Now, uh, if, if you might recall uh, your school days, you, you maybe read Alice in Wonderland when you were a kid. And Lewis Carroll in that novel has a, a, just a classic conversation that takes place between Alice and someone. There is a, a, there is a fork in the road and Alice is confused and doesn't know which way to go. And as she's pondering which way to go, she looks up in a tree and she sees a cat. It's the Cheshire cat, if you remember Alice in Wonderland. And so she begins, it's a talking cat, and so she has a conversation with this cat. And let me read to you exactly how, Al, uh, how it says it in Alice in Wonderland, all right? Um, Alice, <clears throat> would, would you tell me please which way I ought to go from here? And the cat said, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. Alice said, well, I don't much care where. And then the cat said, then it doesn't much matter which way you go. Uh, was, uh, so long as I get somewhere, Alice said. Oh, you're sure to do that, the cat said, if only you walk long enough. You all are gonna end up somewhere. I'm gonna end up somewhere, you're gonna end up. It's, it, it, it's not just gonna happen, it's gonna be because you chose certain choices. And those choices take you to certain places. And, and, and you can live your life and say, you know, every time I come to a crossroads, I'm just going to flip a coin. I don't care which way it goes and your life will be haphazard. Or you can decide, I want to get to a certain destination and I want to, and I want to make sure that I get there. So um, let me say it this way. And, and this is, I, I think, the easiest way. Your destination is not determined by your intentions. Your destination is determined, uh, it, it's the choices you make, your, your destination uh, it's the direction you go. And so the question is simply going to be, when you come to a fork in the road, which way are you going to go? Uh, we, uh, we, I, I wanted to end up there. I want to end up in New York. Well, you took the wrong road and you're in Seattle now, so whatever. Your destination is not determined by your attention, but by your direction. And then the big idea for this entire series I talked about last week was this idea. We first make our choices and then our choices make us. You're making tons of choices right now. I'm making tons of choices. Those choices that you get to make now will make you. You're the sum total of all the choices that you've made in your life. And if you want to know what happens to somebody who makes the choices you make, you are what happens. And anyone else who makes those same choices is going to end up exactly where you are. And that's good news or that's bad news. So in this series, what we're doing is we're taking and contrasting two people uh, that were similar uh, but made different decisions. And so every week we're, we're contrasted. So last week we talked about the two men that, was cru that were crucified with Jesus on the cross. And they, they were both criminals and they were both bad guys, which we know this, but the difference between, they're similar, but they're very different. The one on one side, while he's being crucified with Jesus, he basically says to Jesus, he mocks him. Hey, if you're who you say you are, if you're the son of God, do something, get us out of this mess. And then the other one says to that guy, don't you have any fear of God? We deserve this. This is where our choices took us right here. This is what should have happened to us. Nothing, no injustice, but this man pointing to Jesus did nothing wrong and he doesn't deserve this. And uh, he basically said, you know, I believe in you, Jesus. And then he simply said to Jesus, please remember me uh, when you come into, and he said, I, I, I will, you, you'll, you'll be there. And we talked about it all last week, very similar, but very different. Today, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about two guys that were about as opposite of those two guys as you could find. The first is gonna be in Luke 18, the second one's gonna be in Luke 19. And when I say they're opposite, we're gonna talk about two successful businessmen Two very, very successful businessmen who had made a lot of money and were like, they literally had the, you know, life by the tail. They had it going on. So let's jump in. We're going to be in Luke 18. We're going to show you the first one. Now I'm going to do what I normally do, which is I'm going to take a text and we're just going to break it down. Um, I want you to bring a Bible. And because I want you to bring a Bible, we don't put the text up every week. Uh, that makes it too easy for you not to bring a Bible. So uh, if you don't have a Bible, you've got to listen really, really hard to follow along. And I'll read to you what actually happened. Be better if you could read this on, on, on your own in your Bible. Now, before we get to the text, though, there's something I, I've, I've got to ask you. And you've got to be honest with yourself. And, and, and it, it, it's, uh, it's a question that's kind of important. How do you handle hearing news you don't want to hear? It's really important that you think about this. How do you handle news you don't want to hear? You hear news you don't want to hear. How do you handle it? 
How, how do you handle it when you go to a doctor and the doctor tells you something you didn't want to hear? H how do you handle it when you go to your tax accountant or whoever does your taxes and they say, this is what you owe and you, I, I don't want to hear that. What, what, do you, what do you do when your spouse says to you things you don't want to hear? And because you don't listen, you end up going to a counselor, right? <laughs> and then the counselor tells you things you don't want to hear. How, how are you going to handle that? We're all constantly bombarded with stuff that it comes our direction that we just really don't want to hear. You, you get evaluated at work. You go, I don't want to hear this. You see, all of us have a choice. When you hear what you don't want to hear, you can do one of two things. You can literally cross your arms, lean back, and like check out. Like, I'm not listening. Like, no, nothing, no, no, none, none of this matters. Or somebody's trying to tell you something, you need to hear it. You open your hands, you open your arms, you lean forward and you go, help me to understand this. I don't get it. I don't understand. The posture of how you hear what you don't want to hear is going to be crucial. And you're going to see that in the story that we're about to look at. Because here's the reality, folks. The biggest choice you have to make in your life, the most significant choice you have to make, none is greater than what are you going to do with, with God? What are you going to do? It is the most important decision you're going to make. And uh, today's a great day to decide to get it right. But we'll get to that in just a moment. So let's, let's jump into Luke chapter 18. And let me show you the story. Now, the story that we're going to read is... <clears throat> It's about a guy that's come to be known by the title, the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler. Now, this, his story is told in three of the four biographies of Jesus in Matthew and Mark and Luke. They all tell the story. They give us a little bit different details. And when you put them all together, you start to realize this guy was a rich young ruler. Let me explain what I'm talking about. OK, in Matthew 19, we're told that he is young here. We're told that he is a ruler and all the texts say that he was wealthy. Now, let me just say something about the idea of, of a ruler. We, it does not mean that he was some sort of a king or some dignitary. It means that he was a man of prominence. That this was a guy that when he said things, people listened. When he spoke, they jumped. When he addressed, people did things because he said to do things. He, he was kind of the boss, all right? He, he was the man. And, and so when uh, everybody kind of like would see him, they would go, that guy, he's He's an important guy. He's a, he's a man of prominence. He's somebody significant. And, uh, and so we'd listen to him. All right. Now, I want to show you what happens here. And I, I think this is really, really important. This guy has everything going for him. But here's what I want you to think about. Everything he had wasn't enough. That's what I want you to think about. Everything he had, it just simply wasn't enough. So let me show you the story. Here's how it goes, okay? A certain ruler uh, asked him, asked Jesus, a good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, there's a number of things here I want to just comment on. First off, the, the phrase good teacher, that was awkward, all right? Now, that might not sound weird to your ears, but I'm sure it was to Jesus, uh, because the first thing that Jesus comments on is that salutation, good teacher, all right? Now, why would he call him? You would call him good rabbi or rabbi or teacher, but good teacher is an interesting way to address Jesus. Now, it could be that he was flattering Jesus. It could be that he was setting up Jesus for a debate. We don't really know, but Jesus caught the expression and thought that's odd because he's going to address it. But the, the, get beyond that, good teacher. And then he asked a question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Huge question, important question. Uh, I've done everything in my life. Everything's worked out great. But, but what do, uh, let's talk about eternal life. What do I have to do to get that? And he begins to process that. Uh, you know, it's interesting. In, in, in one sense, what he's saying to Jesus, what do I have to do to be saved? Now, now please understand this, okay? Uh, this guy has done a lot and he's achieved a lot, but it's not enough. He's empty. He's going... I need to know, you have something I don't have. How do I get that thing that you have that I don't have? What do, what do I have to do to inherit this? Uh, it, it's a critically important question. It's a question all of us ought to be asking, like right now. He's so far ahead of so many of us because we live in a day and age, we don't think about eternity much anymore. To our peril, we don't think about what comes next. We don't think about where's this thing, what's after this? What are the choices I'm making today gonna lead to for eternity? We don't tend to think about it. He did. And basically what he was doing was saying, hey, I don't want to get to the end of my life and regret where I ended up. And, and I don't want to end up and not have eternal life. So what do I have to do to get it? As if it were another acquisition to add to his portfolio. 
another achievement of which he could write off and say, you know, I, I've done that. Anyway, it, it, so he, good teacher, what, what must I do now? What do I have to do to get it? Verses 19 and 20. And by the way, what do I have to do? That's the question. What do I have to do? The word do implies I got an action, something on my part. What do I have to, like, not what you did, what do I do? And it's very important you understand. That's what he's trying to figure out. I got to do more than I've already done, which he's done a lot. Now, <clears throat> in verses 19 and 20, Jesus responds, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Now, you know the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony. Honor your father and your mother. Now, the first thing Jesus addresses is, why do you call me good? He basically says, what, what's behind that phrase? Because the only good one is God. Now, what you're going to understand, and this is important that you get right now, is he thinks he's good. This man thinks he's good. You'll see it in just a moment. He thinks he's good. And Jesus goes, why, why do you call me good? Um, the only good one is the Father. Now, every time Jesus claimed to be God, you got to understand he was putting himself at the same power as the Father, and he was equating the goodness of God to himself. But that's not what this man's thinking. He's trying to measure up. He's measuring himself, which you'll see. Again, just hang on to that for just a moment. Um, so Jesus just kind of lists off five of the Ten Commandments. And I, I don't know, could you do that? If, if you were just put on the spot, could you just, hey, name five of the Ten Commandments? You know, there was a day I think most of us could have done that, but it's so far removed from our culture that most of us don't even know what the Ten Commandments. What, what are they? They used to be posted in schools. They used to be posted in civic places, but not so much anymore. So he just says five of the Ten Commandments. And it might seem totally random to you, um, but, but it was anything but random. But when, when Jesus said, do these things, the man said this statement, and I want you to see this, okay? All these things I have kept since I was a boy, he said. I have done all of that. Now, I just want you to stop for a minute and just think, if Jesus said, do these five things, and would you go, uh-huh, check, 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 check. I, I mean, I've done most of those things in my lifetime, but his implication, I've never failed to do these things. I've, this is who I am. I always do. I have never screwed up. I have never done anything outside of that. Now, let me point out again, this is real important. This guy has done everything he believes in his heart. He has done everything he was supposed to do to keep, to keep the commandments. Check, 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 check. And it wasn't enough to fulfill him. Keeping rules, keeping lists, doing what you think is not going to bring peace to your heart. And it didn't bring it to his. Now, when Jesus heard this, I've done all this since I was a boy. He said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and, and give to the poor and, and you'll have treasures and treasure in heaven. And then, then come and follow me. Ditch all your stuff. Leave all that behind and then come follow me. Now, I told you this was in Matthew, Mark and Luke. In Mark, Mark gives us a little insight I want to show you. When, when this, po this point of the story, as Mark told it, it says this. Jesus looked at him and loved him. So he's not hunking on this guy. He's not slamming this guy. He's not trying to put this guy in his place. He's basically saying, I need to tell you what you don't want to hear. I need to tell you something that's very difficult for you to comprehend. Your stuff is a problem for you. Your stuff is getting in the way. The last thing that he wanted to hear. Now, this is the important point you need to get right here. So Jesus rattles off five of the Ten Commandments. You might not know this, but it was number five through nine that he listed off. That's what he did. He skipped the first four. Do you have any idea what the first four commandments are? They have to do with you and God. The last six have to do with you and people. He listed five of the people ones. The last one he didn't mention was coveting. But what he didn't mention was one through four. You know what commandment number one is? Exodus 20, verse 3, you shall have no other gods before me. And, and Jesus looks at this man in love. He goes, you know what your big problem is? You love this stuff far more than you love God. And if you want to have eternal life, you got to get this stuff out of your life. You have to move it out of the way. You might remember when Jesus was asked, well, what's the greatest commandment? It was a trick question. We're trying to trap him. But they asked him, teacher, 
you know, hey, of all the commandments, it, it's found in Matthew 22, 36, and it says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. Now, you gotta understand what Jesus was saying to this guy, the rich young ruler, you don't love God with all your heart, soul, mind. You don't, because your stuff is blurring your vision. Your stuff is blocking. Your stuff has become an obstacle between you and the Father because you can't see the Father past your stuff. Verse 23 says, when he heard this, the man heard this, he became very sad. It's not what he wanted to hear, very sad, because he was very wealthy, hugely successful, hyper successful. And Jesus says, you want eternal life, you wanna be saved, you gotta get rid of that. And he goes, oh, that's a ridiculous price to pay. I'm not sure I'm gonna pay that price. But I want you to notice something, because I think this is really important. I don't want you to miss it. When Jesus said, uh, I, I want you to sell your possessions, give it to the poor, he did not say, Look, I want you to take all you've ever accomplished. I want you to put it up in flames. I want you to burn it. I want you to destroy it. I want to you go and you know, go dump it in a dumpster somewhere. That's not what he said. He said, use what you have to make a difference to people who don't have what you have. That this is interesting. He didn't just say destroy it. No, use it for something positive. And when he hears this, he's like, uh, there's a choice to be made. And he's gonna make the wrong choice. And Jesus could see it on his face. He could see it on his face. And so it says this. And Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. He said that to his face. You think that man wanted to hear that? And he goes, no, 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 no. You don't understand, I'm incredibly wealthy. I'm a highly successful person. This ought to qualify me for heaven. I mean, I'm obviously good. And it's, he's like, wait a minute, what's going on? How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven? Now, he's not saying it can't be done, but he is saying that wealth can become a huge obstacle. And the good news for us, folks, the great news for us is we do not have to worry about being rich, right? Because we're not rich, right? Wrong. We're the richest people on the planet, and we know it. You know it. And, And this is why walking with God in our culture has become so difficult. We are so affluent. We have so much. It's so easy to fall in love with all the stuff and want more and more stuff and find happiness, to seek happiness, more and more possessions. So he says it's hard for the rich to enter. And then this man just walks away. Now I want you to picture the scene. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit? Uh, You need to sell all your stuff. His face falls, he looks at Jesus, he turns around and he just walks away. He just walks away from Jesus. Now, just think for a moment. In our culture, we would go, okay, whoa, 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 stop, stop. But like you're bargaining in Tijuana. Okay, maybe that was a little harsh. How about this? Come back, come back. Don't leave. How about you give away three quarters of your stuff? You keep a quarter. How about two thirds? You get the idea. How, this bargain here. I want you to see Jesus doesn't do that. You will have no other gods before me. And if you do, you will not inherit eternal life. He lets a man walk. It's a hard truth, man. You think this guy wanted, he was expecting, I think he was expecting Jesus to go, okay, 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 let's renegotiate. He doesn't do that at all. And then it says this, so how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And then he says, indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Now, there's all kinds of speculation on what he meant. I just think I want to point, I don't have time. I just want to point out, it was literally, the word is used for a needle, okay? Like you pull thread. It's hyperbole, it's ridiculous. It's like, how can you fit a camel through that? It's really, really hard to do. And folks, this is not what we want to hear, is it? I don't want to hear this. You don't want to hear this. No, 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 I can have all my stuff and I can love all the things that life gives me, but I still want to go to heaven and I want to have God and I want to have God and stuff. If your stuff is your God, it's gonna block your relationship with the Father. When then those who heard it asked, well, this is the disciples, who then could be saved? Now, that's a great question. What must I do to inherit, uh, inherit eternal life? How do I get saved? You, you, no other gods before me. Well, then who can be saved? Now you gotta understand, this is a fascinating question. In, in, in the culture of the day, Jewish and prosperity went together, okay? And in many ways still do, obviously. 
Jewish and prosperity. The, the, this man is a highly successful Jewish man. What do you mean he's not going to get into heaven? And so they're all going, what do, uh, what do we do? To get, how, do you, how does anyone get saved then? And uh, then Jesus says this, and I think this is so important. And Jesus replied, what is impossible with man is possible with God. What does that mean? Here's what it means, folks. It's impossible for you to save yourself. Please listen to me. It is impossible for you to be good enough that God owes you heaven. It is impossible for you to live your life in such a way that God goes, well, I didn't want to let you in, but I guess you get in. Who can be saved? Every and anyone who relies on Jesus Christ. That, it's impossible. No, no, it's possible, but you've got to get over yourself and you've got to put your confidence in him. Now, listen, listen, you've got to make a different choice because the easiest thing for us to do is put more confidence in our accomplishments than Jesus's accomplishment. Do you hear what I just said? Yeah, but I've done this, this, and this, and we got our lifts and all this stuff we've done and, and that should get me in. None of that's going to get you in. What's going to get you in is a relationship with Jesus. That's what's going to get you in. And you've got to make a decision. You're going to rely on this or you're going to rely on that. So then it ends. That story ends. Peter said to them, well, we've left all we had to follow you. And truly, I tell you, Jesus, uh, tell, truly, I tell you, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Let me, let me translate. You make a choice for Jesus, you're not going to lose. You make a choice for Jesus, you're going to come out ahead. You make a choice for Jesus, and whatever it would cost you, the benefit's going to be greater than the cost. It's the best choice with what to do with your life. And, but it's yours to make. Nobody can make it for you. Now, that was story one. Now, the second story won't take me near as long. The second story just follows it in Luke 19, and it's about a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. Now, let me just show you. So this is one guy, the rich young ruler. We got his story. Now, let me show you the juxtaposed, uh, the juxtaposed uh, other illustration. Another very, very wealthy, very successful man. Uh, so Luke 19, 1 to 10. Let's go through it, okay? Uh, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there, uh, a man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, there's so much here to unpack. He, he, he is not just a tax collector. He is a, he's a chief tax collector. Now, here's what you got to understand about tax collectors in this culture. They, they were detested. They, they were absolutely hated. Here's why. Rome is occupying Israel, all right? Rome is the occupying force, their rules, their laws, but the Jewish people had to pay tribute to Rome for the honor of being oppressed by Rome. But how were they going to get the money? So Rome would hire Jewish people to be the tax collectors among their own. And so these people were hated because they were seen as traitors. How could you work for them? How could you? Do? But see, it was such a lucrative business. What would happen is they would become wealthy. They'd get rich if they would just take the money from the Jewish people, give it over to Rome. But what it became known for was that they would take what they were supposed to and then they would demand more. And because they had the power of Rome behind them, the people didn't have any choice to rebel. They had to pay the price because these, they represent Rome. And um, so tax collectors were just hated. And then we just found out this guy is the chief tax collector. All the other guys, he's the head honcho. He's the boss. They all answer to him. And all of this, you know, so this is a horrible, horrible situation. Um, let me show you the next verse, verse three. So this very wealthy tax collector, well, he wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. This gets fun. So if you went to Sunday school and you have any memories of learning about Zacchaeus, you remember flannel graphs? and a song. And the thing that Zacchaeus is known for is being short. By the way, Roy Lawson's really short. You'll see that next week, but I digress. Anyway, Zacchaeus was short. And so we sing a song about him. Did you go to Sunday school? Do you remember the song? Zacchaeus, he was a wee little man, a wee little, I can't hear you. <laughs> there you are. He climbed up in the sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. Remember this? 
He's a wee little man. He's a short little guy. And now here's what you got to understand. People had heard about Jesus, but you didn't get to see him, but he's walking by. And this is his opportunity. I get to see him. Now it's not Instagram. It's not TikTok. It's real life. This is not recorded. He's coming this direction. And Zacchaeus is going, I got to find a place. I got to find a place. And so he runs ahead and he, well, he's a short little guy. So he jumps into a, well, look at verse four. He ran ahead, climbed a sycamore fig tree. And since Jesus was coming that way, I'm going to get a glimpse of him one way or the other. Now, let me just, okay. Can we just acknowledge that for this wealthy, successful chief tax collector, this is lacking dignity. Can I get an amen? This is not like what dignified, he's climbing up a tree. I got to get a look. All right. And then verse five and six says, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, this is just so cool. Jesus coming along and all of a sudden, and a sycamore tree is a full leafed tree. Okay. It's not like a thin, he's in the tree and Jesus looks up and he sees him. All right. Uh, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. Folks, there is so much in here. Does it not fascinate you that Jesus looks up at the tree, sees the guy and goes, Zacchaeus, is that you? He knew the guy by name. He had never met him. This story wouldn't be the story if Zacchaeus and Jesus go way back. He'd never seen the guy. And Jesus looks up and goes, Zacchaeus, I need to talk to you today. Um, that's fascinating. And then, he, and then he basically says, hey, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. That's not a polite thing to say to a man in a tree, right? Come down right now. Get out of that tree. Get out of that tree now. And so Zacchaeus is going like, and who are you? You sense urgency in Jesus. You sense intentionality in Jesus. And, uh, um, and, and by the way, on more than a few occasions, Jesus knew of somebody's heart, their intentions, their character. Jesus could just, and how he did it, I don't know. But anyway, when Jesus asked him to get out of that tree, I want you to see something. This is crucial to the story. Without question and without hesitation, the man did what Jesus said. It says he came down at once and he came down gladly. Now, this is where I think this story gets fascinating. So Jesus says to the man in the tree that everybody hates, hey, come down here, man. I need to hang out with you. We need to go to your house. We need to do lunch. We need to do some time. Now, how do you think other people are going to respond? Let me show you something. All right, the next verse. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. Now, let me point something out here that you got to see. The only people who would be bothered that he went to be the guest of a sinner are religious people. Do you understand what I'm saying? Nobody else could care less. It's the religious people who see Jesus say to that guy in the tree who they know that guy, we can't stand him. He's an outcast. He is a low life. And Jesus says, I want to go with you. He's going to go hang out with him. The only people who would care are religious people. And they click their tongues as it were. And, and I love the word it used. They muttered. Now, you know what muttering is? Remember in school learning uh, what an uh, onomatopoeia is? Remember this? That's obscure. Onomatopoeia is when you say a word that when you say the word, you do what the word says. The word buzz. You can't say buzz without buzzing. You can't say hiss without hissing. You can't mutter without muttering. They muttered. You ever been muttered at? Mutter is when somebody is voicing their discontent with you, but they don't say it to your face. They say it behind your back and they say it under their voice. They muttered. And you know what they were muttering? If this guy knew who that guy was, he wouldn't hang out with him because he would only hang out with holy good people. And folks, this is where I think we got most wrong about Jesus. And I want you to hear my heart here. This is where religious people get Jesus so wrong. We think if, if, we, if we follow Jesus, we're going to keep ourselves from all the bad people and we're going to have nothing to do with them. That's not the way Jesus lived. You know what Jesus is doing right here? Exactly what we try our hardest to teach all of us in this church to do, to love beyond the line, to love the person on the other side of the difference between you and them, to show dignity and respect to somebody that nobody else is showing dignity. So who in our culture would be the person who's that guy that everyone wants to click their tongue at that religious people love to hate on? Who, who's that guy? Who's that person? I'm not going to name names, but if you're thinking about it, you can come up with some. 
And we go, Christian people would have nothing to do with those people, except Christ had a lot to do with those people. And those people ran to Jesus and they run away from us because we're not much like Jesus. Jesus loved beyond. Yeah. And here's what you need to understand. He, he, he walks away with Zacchaeus. They walk together to Zacchaeus' house. He leaves the crowd behind, just angry as can be. Like, he didn't care is the point. He absolutely, Zacchaeus has no redeeming traits. That you go, well, at least he's, no, he's not a thing. He's nothing good about Zacchaeus. Except that when Jesus said, I want to be with you, Jesus, Zacchaeus said, okay. Now I want to show you what happens next. That's fascinating. But Zacchaeus comes out of the tree. He stood up and he said to the Lord, listen carefully. This is what he said. Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Now you understand what he just did? Half of what I got, I'm going to give to the poor. And I'll tell you what, of the half I've got, if I've cheated anybody, now let me just say this, for a tax collector in, in this culture to say, if I've cheated anybody, it's the same as saying, all those I've cheated. Okay, it'd be like, have you ever, have you ever gone to an honest casino? No, the, no, it's honest, I mean, it's 50-50, you could win, you could lose, it's honest. It's just straight up, no, there's no honest casinos. And folks who are not honest tax collectors in this day, in this culture. If I've cheated anyone, meaning I've cheated up to four times, I'll, I'll, get it, I'll, I'll straighten it out. Now, here's the thing I want you to understand. This is crucial. Jesus didn't ask him to do that. Jesus didn't ask him. Why? It wasn't his God. His stuff was not his God. This is so important to process this. You, you, Jesus has no problem with you having stuff if your stuff doesn't become your God. But the minute you can't let go of it, I don't, don't be the one to tell you. I hate to be the one to tell you. I don't want to do this, but your stuff is your God. So that story ends with this. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. This man is saved. This man is going to heaven. Now remember the rich young ruler. What do I have to do to be saved? He walked away. Jesus didn't drop the offer. Didn't change the price. This guy, salvation came to this man's house uh, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Now, can I, again, please listen carefully, church. Please listen to me. This was the passion of Jesus. This was the mission of Jesus, to seek and to save the lost. We think Jesus came for the religious people. Jesus did not come for the religious people. That's why he said, the healthy don't need a doctor. It's the sick who need a doctor. I came to care for the lost. Church, our priority needs to not be about those who are religious and good. It needs to be about people who desperately need a relationship with Jesus. So here's a story of two men, two totally different outcomes. Now, let me wrap it up. What's it mean for you and me? Well, first off, I would say this. It means we have attachment issues as a culture. Let's just admit that. We have things that we find comfort in. We have things that we want to hold on to. We just want to just, we want to, I want to do it myself. And I want to feel good about the fact that I did it. And I said this before, but let me repeat it. If I got to make a choice between my own achievements and God's achievements, why do I want to choose mine? What is it in me that makes me feel like, well, I'm better off just doing it on my own when Jesus said it's impossible for you to do it on your own and make it? What is it in your life that has become that thing that is so important you could not give up if it meant you could actually go to heaven if you would? And I don't know what it is. And it's different for all of us. What is that thing that you would hold? I want a fortune. I want success. I want fame. I want a relationship I will not let go of. What is it that you wouldn't let go of? It's a choice you are making. And while I'm going to say this and it's going to be blunt and it's abrupt, what would you rather go to hell with than heaven without? I got my little hands clutched around this thing, whatever this thing is, I'm not letting go. If you don't let go, it will cost you, it, that choice to hold on will cost you eternity. Well, I'm not letting go. Then you're like the rich young ruler. 
Or you come along and you go, this is Jesus, man. There's nothing greater. I have a choice. I get to be in a relationship with Jesus. I choose Jesus. And I'm nothing in all my life and anything I got is his and it's all good. You know, Jesus offers us eternal life and forgiveness and grace, mercy, kindness. It, it, and again, I said this last week, but it's so important that we understand this. How did Jesus say to that man on the cross, cru that crucified criminal, today you'll be with me in paradise. It is not about what you do. It's about what you believe. So this verse I showed you last week, for it is by grace that you have been saved, okay, through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. For we are God's work, or handicraft or workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. <clears throat> it's not about you. It's not about your goodness, it's about his goodness. But you gotta make a choice. I'm gonna surrender my goodness and my accomplishments to gain his. In Revelation 20, uh, Revelation 3, 20, it says, three, uh, I stand at the door, Jesus, I stand at the door and I knock. And, and, and by the way, I don't know if you've noticed this, but in our culture, when somebody knocks on your door, you either hide under the sofa, yeah, like, who is that? Or you get up and you answer the door. You got a choice. You can hide or you can respond. So we're gonna give you a choice right now to make that'll last for an eternity. But here's the deal. If, if you choose yes, then what you have to say is Jesus comes first. Nothing's gonna get in the way, nothing before Jesus. That's what it means when you make him the Lord. He's the highest authority, he's the boss. And in our church on certain Sundays, which just happens to be one of them, we do a thing that involves towels. And we're doing that thing right now. Let me explain it to you. First off, I wanna ask this. I'm gonna ask, nobody leave on any of our campuses. No, nobody leave. And we got people that are preparing right now. So that's what's happening. But here's the deal. We're gonna invite you, if you wanna make a choice for Jesus and to not choose for Jesus is to choose not for Jesus, just so we're clear, choose for him to come up here and pick up a towel. The towels are white on purpose, and they represent two things. White is the universal symbol of surrender. When you wave a white flag, you're saying, I give, I give. Don't shoot me, all right, I give. It's the statement that you're done doing it on your own and you're ready to be rescued, as it were. So we take a white flag. The second reason we use a white towel is so significant that the scripture says that though our sins be as scarlet, red, stained red, blood red with guilt, you receive Jesus, you open your heart up, you make a choice for Jesus and your heart will be turned white, white as snow. You will be washed of your sins, white as snow. Why anyone wouldn't choose this is beyond me, but that's, that's not my choice. What about you? So here's what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna ask you to um, stand up and I'm gonna ask you not to leave and we're gonna just invite you to come get a towel. And, and if you come and get a towel, what's gonna happen is, is they're gonna take you, uh, they're gonna escort you around. We have clothes for you to change in. We have private dressing rooms in the back. All of that's set up. They're waiting for you, all right? We're ready for you. And uh, all you gotta do is just come get a towel and then we're gonna sing some songs together and we're just gonna celebrate as some people get baptized who made a choice for Jesus. When, when somebody chooses Jesus, the angels in heaven rejoice. And so we're gonna clap and we're gonna cheer and we're gonna go crazy, but we're gonna get to see. And not only are you gonna see what's happening here, you're gonna get to see what's happening on other campuses because this is an incredible moment. This is your moment to make a choice for Jesus. So I'm gonna ask if you would, rise to your feet, let me pray. And then the band will begin to sing. We'll sing, you come forward and we will worship uh, a surrendered life, which the best form of worship is when we surrender our life. So we'll surrender this. And then um, what'll happen is people come forward, we'll, we'll clap and cheer. That'll be how we'll conclude the service. Let's pray. 
So Father, thank you for this morning and this opportunity to come together to worship. Thanks for our guests who uh, got to be with us here today. We're privileged and honored to have them. And God, I pray for every single person who's here. Lord, I pray that we would, uh, that we would choose wisely. Uh, it, it's gonna be easy to get to the end of our life and wish we'd have done something else. But God, that's not the choice. The choice is today, the choice is now. The choice is for you or against you. So Lord, if we haven't made a decision for you, I pray that you give us the courage to step out right now and say, yes, we choose you. 